Hello everyone, this is Ellen George with Great Lakes Cisco and I'm at the 13th International Corrigonid Symposium in Bayfield, Wisconsin. And this morning I'm talking with Peter Jacobson from Minnesota Department of Natural Resources on uh, how Lake Superior Cisco that are translocated into inland lakes uh, retain morphological ecological traits. So I'm going to turn it over to him. And Peter, when you're ready, go okay, ahead. Real good. Thank you, Ellen. And hello, everybody. Yeah, we have kind of a unique opportunity to study how some of these uh, traits may or may not be plastic when, when this fish is uh, introduced into a new environment. So in Minnesota, we had a series of lakes that did not contain cisco that had Lake Superior herring introduced into them over 80 years ago. So we went back in the last few years to see what they look like. And it was very interesting. First of all, we just confirmed that from our, our genetic sampling that yes, they were very similar to Lake Superior. They probably were from those introductions and they were very different from other native forms right nearby those lakes. When we looked at the body shape and body morphometry, they look very similar. And that was very interesting to people, especially on the Great Lakes where they're talking about uh, translocation and introductions and reintroductions of different, different forms. This suggests that even after 80 years, mm -hmm. Those fish look very much the same, and they look very different than our native Cisco and other nearby lakes. So that was that was very interesting. And generally, the Lake Superior herring, compared to our inland forms, are are long, short finned, fairly compressed laterally, and they just have that unique unique shape. The other the other interesting things is they also have very short fins compared to our, our native inland forms. And we went, when we look at the actual fin lengths of each of these three different groups, they're still very much like Lake Superior herring, but there's also a little bit of an incremental move towards these inland forms. So if we assume that these inland forms are somehow optimal for those inland lakes, there is a little bit of movement, but it's very slow. It didn't happen in one big plastic kind of kind of change. It's very incremental, very slow. Probably will take on the order of centuries, not decades or years, to get to that point. So that that also is an indication that you know maybe this this plastic genus that we think is so changeable sometimes maybe not so much. Maybe maybe some of these traits are more fixed than than we think. The other really interesting trait that that seemed to be retained is that. In Lake Superior, the lake herring is considered the shallow water cisco form as opposed to the, the deeper water forms like Hoyai, Kaiai, Zenithicus. They retain that. We use uh, vertical gill nets to sample these lakes so we can get depth of capture of each fish. And these lakes introduced Lake Superior herring were captured higher in the water column than the, than the native inland forms. So they kind of retained that kind of shallow water nature of, of the Lake Superior herring. So the, really interesting to see that a number of these traits were retained even after 80 years in a completely new environment. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of uh, questions. Mm -hmm. um, so the if the Lake Superior fish that were translocated, you said about 80 years mm -hmm. ago, approximately, mm -hmm. um, they uh, and they still have retained these traits. How would you um, recommend that people go about, say, introducing Cisco into new um, systems, say systems where they've been extirpated, and uh, managers are looking for source populations of fish um, to start stocking? How would you use this information to make recommendations to those managers on choosing stocks or, or strategies for reintroduction? Yeah, this would certainly suggest that managers would try to find a form that is as close to what that original form looked like, both morphologically and ecologically. Because if they're not very changeable, at least you want to try to replace what was there. Yeah. And if, if you can't do that, the replacing that ecological function of that fish may take a long time. Yeah. It, it may take, like I said, centuries instead of decades. So so some of these some of these forms, Great Lakes, Cisco's maybe you're irre irreplaceable and, yeah. the, and the fish that get brought in are going to be a different fish than what was there before yeah so and they're going to stay different so for it's, a while it's, it's a quandary yeah, yeah it yeah. is um so and and some of these changes um like things like fin length are a little bit 
uh, sometimes more difficult to match to ecological relevancy. Right. But I, I like um, seeing the, the difference in the position in the water column and their uh, yeah. relationship with the thermocline. Um, do you think that um, these fishes, uh, different groups of fish, their relationship to the thermocline, do you think that's ecologically relevant enough to really be to be a concern for managers? I, I think it is. You know, all of the, the Great Lakes are deep except for Erie, so it's probably a factor in a number of them. But the ecological function of those morphological-ish aspects are important. And we've got some data that's not presented here, but essentially our inland forms are a little more benthic, mm -hmm. will utilize a little more benthic organisms than, yeah. than the introduced in Lake Superior herring, which are almost obligate planktivores. They're pelagic, they're shallow water and they, they generally did not go down and use much benthic uh, organisms. And that fin length in literature for other taxa show that for a benthic feeding fish, it's, it's optimal to have longer fins oh, I think okay. for a locomotive type um, capture of prey versus a pelagic planktivore that's just swimming through the water column and picking off okay. individual daphnids, And maybe doesn't daphnids. need to be as so, maneuverable. So the fin, I think the fin link does have an ecological okay, good. function, <laughs> and, it, and it might be related to, to diet. We do, and we're, we're starting to look at that with some of our data. Okay, so. yeah, very interesting. Um, and the lakes that, uh, like I know the inland populations historically had Cisco, mm -hmm. and uh, in your poster you say that the introduced ones, those lakes maybe historically did not have Cisco. That's correct. Um, are, those, are those two groups of lakes fairly comparable though? Or they do they are. similar? We, okay. These, the, 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 the set of lakes we pick all have uh, good water quality, good hypolimatic oxygen. So all of these lakes, those fish had the free range to uh, range essentially from the thermocline down to the bottom. Our surface water, our epilemnias are, are too warm on our inner lakes for okay. Cisco. So they're almost always found below the thermocline. So from that point of view, they were very similar. But these lakes are very different than Lake Superior. Lake Superior is yes. far colder. Oxygen isn't an issue. They have far greater depths to range. So a, a very different habitat than Lake Superior. Very cool. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to sign off now, but thank you, Peter, for joining us. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back in a few, or actually, I think about, what time is it now? 8.22. So we'll be back in about an hour um, for some more talks, and we'll see you later. Thanks, Peter.